Hey, good morning, afternoon, whatever time of day it is. Thank you so much for joining us again at Arise Online. Uh, for those of you that came looking for us last week, you would have missed us. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, we're trying hard to uh, get on top of all that needs to be done to make sure we keep uh, our, our YouTube channel up and running every week. But that's a blip in the matrix. We're back online now, so we're so glad that you're joining us. Hey, we've got a great word coming your way today from Daniel Pennington from Compassion here in Australia. He's going to talk to us about costly grace and what it means to follow Jesus, particularly at a time like this where we live in the midst of a crazy world with lots of things challenging our faith and lots of voices competing for our our attention and if you enjoy uh, what you hear today if you feel like it really blesses you and is helping you in your faith walk why don't you hit the share button and flick it across to somebody else if you want to find us quicker next week then why don't you think about hitting the subscribe button also we'd love to hear from you uh, there's an email address at the bottom of the screen if God's been encouraging you and doing great things in your world we'd love to be encouraged by what he's doing in your life so feel free to let us know we'd also love to pray for you uh, if you've got any prayer requests that we can lift up before God on your behalf anyway I hope you enjoy this message from Daniel Penny on Costly Grace. No, sweet. Excellent. Right here, why don't we uh, give Dan a hand this morning as he comes and shares with us. about that. <laughs> Good morning, family. How are you guys? Um, to answer the question right off, don't let the accent deceive you. I did not come from America. Okay. Um, no, I did actually, but not for this. Um, my name is Dan, uh, here representing Compassion, Heart of Compassion, uh, releasing children from poverty. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about that. There's, oh, there you go. You get a, a great picture. If you've heard of Compassion, if you haven't, Good thing you're here. Um, but if you have heard of Compassion, I, it's an amazing organization that I have a chance to be a part of. Uh, oh, I live in Newcastle. So not Sydney, Newcastle, okay? Come up from Newcastle, and, but previously um, uh, we lived in, up on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, uh, way that we love the Sunshine Coast, but I guess I can't get there anymore. We're just talking about like the crazy border stuff going on. Um, and the reality, uh, uh, we've been, uh, my wife is Australian. And so we, there we go, met, met through YWAM. I think you guys might have heard of these crazy YWAM or crazy people before. Yes? That's my heart, my passion. Uh, God used YWAM uh, as a platform. It brought me um, to Australia. It gave me an opportunity to serve in mission. We were with YWAM for about 15 years. Uh, and so that's kind of how I had a chance to, to meet Al, to meet um, and to be a part of, of this service this morning. So for those of you I haven't met, which is most of you, uh, Jeff, I had a chance to meet you. Uh, a few people that came around. Ruth, thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you, and so nice to be in God's presence this morning. Isn't that such a cool thing? A real, uh, a real privilege. I, you know, I was just saying to Al this morning, like, um, I'm, so, I'm so blessed and encouraged to be here. I know you expect that from a speaker, a guest speaker, to come say, oh, it's so nice to be here, but it, it's actually so good to be in God's presence, eh? To be among God's family, and um, my parents are, 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 are recently, yeah, he's re my dad retired from the military after about 33 years, uh, long story there, and he's now a minister in, in the States. And so they pastor a small church there, and the heartbeat for them, man, it's so much about their, uh, the community that comes, even with all the stuff going on with COVID, like it's such a powerful reflection of what Alan said. This is, this is spiritual warfare, hey? This is us going against um, the enemy of our world, the reality of the pride of the flesh, the pride of life that seeks to break us down. And we have a promise in Scripture that the kingdom of God goes forward and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So that's what we're a part of this morning. Is that a cool thing? Really cool. Oh, so good. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to try to use this because I think I feel like it'll keep me, maybe help me, Alan, to be a little bit more centered. I don't know. Centered on notes. And I got some... Um, I just got a little word. Uh, Alan invited me to come and share on my heart, uh, uh, specifically something that God's been speaking to me about in this season. And I, and I think it's really interesting with COVID. You talk about coughing. I, I, <laughs> I had a coughing fit the other day. Um, and it was, you know, you get like a tickle in your throat and you're in a cafe and you can't get it out and everyone's looking at you and you're like, ah. And I had to get, I, I didn't do the whole like shameful runoff thing, but I had to get up. I had to go get some water call myself. 
Do not have COVID, guys. It's okay. Um, uh, but yeah, you, it's a crazy world that we're living in. Uh, there's a, a, a quote from someone that works in compassion over in the States at the moment, and he stated this. I just think it's a really specific thing. Uh, Richard Miller, he says, the coronavirus pandemic um, has brought the machinery of modern life to an end. Brought the machinery of modern life to an end. Um, and that is both scary as well as a very incredibly hopeful statement, yeah? Because uh, reality is we, we're not made for this world. We're made for something way beyond here. And so this is just a place where we have a chance to come and share and be a part of what God's doing among us and say, hey, look, guys, come and join this and be a part of the eternal story, the kingdom of God that we are invited to, to partner and journey in. And that is an incredible thing. But it's also scary. It's a scary time. You know, I, from an American perspective, a family in the States and watching the news. I remember watching the news the other night with the wife and I'm like, this is what the end of the world would look like. You know what I mean? With protests and with crazy uh, violence. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity. And um, it actually reminds me, uh, it reminds me of a time uh, when, specifically in the world, when a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A few of you guys. Okay, so good. The Cost of Discipleship, it's still in publication today. Uh, in German, the original language it was written in, it was just called following or the way of following. And he wrote, he wrote this in a time, it was actually published in 1937. And if anyone knows anything about their history, 1937 was like the, the peak of the Nazi German growth as a political party and their domination. And we know the end of that story. But he's writing to the German church, to Christians, German Christians, saying, grace costs us something. Grace costs us something. And for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that was his life. He literally died in a concentration camp as a Christian standing up for his faith. But he wrote these words, and I just want to encourage you guys with this. Encouragement. It's an encouragement, guys. It's encouragement for all of us. Because we are challenged in times of global pandemic to really evaluate, well, how much does my faith cost me? You know, how much, how willing am I to literally lay my life on the line for my belief to follow Jesus? And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he describes, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without required repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. I love this line. It's grace without Jesus Christ. Living and incarnate. And in contrast, he writes, costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and contrite heart. Let me read that again. It comes as a word of forgiveness to a broken spirit and contrite heart. It's costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It's grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Can you look over to someone closer to you and say, Jesus' yoke is easy, his burden is light? Try that. Jesus' yoke is easy. There you go. A little hard when they're not right next to you. I appreciate it. So social distance. It's okay. Um, we're going to look into just a few verses real quickly, and I want to share a few words, uh, uh, an encouragement from my heart, uh, a few practical steps this morning that we can begin to reflect on what it means to live in a world of costly grace. Um, we're going to look at um, Luke 14, verses 25 through 30. So I'll give you that time if you want to look it up on your app or whatever, but I'll probably have it on the screen as well. But you all right if I pray? We can just center ourselves. Father, I, we come before you this morning. I want to thank you so much for the, yeah, as Alan said, uh, the courage of each one of the people here, and even people making time to watch this on the screen perhaps, to come and to center ourselves in you. And to affirm that our life is in you, Father. The natural attrition of our world pulls us away every day from the reality of your grace. The reality of your presence. The reality that we can't take a breath without you. 
We give you the praise this morning. We give you all the honor, and we choose to walk in your way to follow you. We love you, Father. Thank you for your word. In Luke 14, I like the way, Jesus, the way Luke describes this. This is a couple of times in the gospel, this, this, this specific story. But he talks about what it means to be a disciple several points. But in Luke 14, I'll just read it out. Um, this is kind of at the height of Jesus' ministry, okay? This is like, he's like uber popular. This is like he's got the most Twitter and Instagram followers ever, okay? He's up there. Now great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. For whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, wanting to build the tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after you'd laid the foundation and can't finish it, all the onlookers, onlookers would begin to make fun of him and say, <laughs> this man, he started to build and wasn't able to finish. I have a picture, actually. I'm sorry, I'm probably jumping around too much. If you go back a few slides, there's a picture of my family. Um, he says, you must hate your, your wife and your children. Well, I, that speaks to me. I've got, so my wife is the pretty one. Um, there in the back, her name's Katrina. She's originally from Port Macquarie. Anyone been to Port Macquarie? Yeah, woo! I love Port beautiful spot. Uh, and these are my four beautiful children, none of which chose to come up with me this weekend. Mm-hmm. But that's okay. Um, so my oldest is my girl, sort of opposite to you guys' family, Eva, there in the front. Uh, and then Aiden is the one right behind her. He loves his skateboarding. He's seven. Um, Levi is the one that's way too interested in the bag of lollies there on the left. Um, and he just turned four. He was born 10 weeks early, so we spent three months in hospital with him. He's doing really well, and he's very tall, but he still gets carried around by mom sometimes. Uh, and our baby, our little baby girl, or our little baby boy, sorry. Um, I have a little girl here that I'm going to tell you about shortly. Um, our little baby boy, his name is Matthew. He just turned two. So, yeah, it's a busy household. Busy household. Um, Eva... Eva got sent home from school, I think, two days ago because uh, um, she, you know, she had a runny nose. And it's like corona-like symptoms. So she got tested, and she doesn't have a corona. Uh, but I'm like, come on, guys. Like, we're paid for their school, right? It's not like they, they, up on this coast they had a chance to just go to, it's not a big deal when they go to the state school. But this one, I'm like, oh, come on. Anyway. So when it says you must hate your wife and your children to follow me, whoo, that's a pretty hard line, right? What is Jesus saying here? What's the heartbeat? I'm not going to get all deep theological on you, and you can look into further. There's, a, there's some deep heartbeat here of what Jesus calls us to, a dramatic line. We're referencing Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a willingness to say, yeah, you know what, I'm going to stand in Germany and preach to churches, and tell them how to live out costly grace, and it's going to cost me my life. It might not look that um, black and white sometimes to us, but there's a calling here for each of us. And I'm just going to, I just want to leave you with a few practical steps this morning for all of us to begin to reflect in our own lives. First one, do you hate what pushes you away from God? Do you hate what pushes you away from God? I love this quote so much, I put it up here, uh, from Susanna Wesley. Her son, you might have heard of Charles Wesley, okay? A few of you guys, a few nodding heads. Younger folk, Charles Wesley, look him up. Okay, you wrote a lot of songs. Um, there's, he actually, she, I think she had like nine kids, okay? She, and, and, and Charles um, uh, Finney Wesley, I think, was another one that went on to do some pretty amazing things for God's kingdom. Um, I'm not going to get into church history here, but crazy family, okay? Crazy family from God. We love Charles Wesley. We love the songs and the books and the theology and what he spoke. Where did he get that from? His mom. 
because he went up to his mom as a young kid and said, Mom, what's sin? Like, can you just tell me? Like, give me the, you know what I mean? Like, don't play cards. Don't drink. Don't go fishing on Sunday, Alan. Don't do that. No, that's not, that's, that, and, and Susanna Wesley didn't answer that way because that's not, that's not sin. That's not what scripture teaches us. So what was her answer? She said, and I quote, whatever weakens your reason, whatever impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. That's, a, that's full on, because I can count a few things even this morning that might have taken my relish away from God. How about instead of when we came into church, we, we didn't just have to put down our, our name and our, our number, but we actually had to put down our, you know, things that we struggled with that day or that week. How many of us would, would come into church then? I, I probably wouldn't. Being honest, there's a challenge here. And when Jesus says and turns to the crowd and says, you must hate your father and mother. No, he's not saying you have to hate your father and mother. He's saying, what in your life pushes you, uh, you love more than me? That pushes you away from me? Do you hate what pushes you away from God? Do you love what draws you close to him? That increases your relish for spiritual things. Secondly, are you living your life with the end in mind? Jesus said, for which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost? Otherwise, he's laid the foundation, can't finish it. And all the onlookers will make fun of him. I love that line, that last line of this verse where he says, this man, he started to build the tower and wasn't able to finish. These guys, they said they wanted to follow Christ, but they didn't finish. His disciples asked him, Jesus, who's... Who actually gets into heaven? Who's the one that makes it? Who's the one that's a true disciple and follower of me? And Jesus says, you know what? The one that sticks with me to the end? Easy answer. <laughs> Full on. That's a daily, weekly, moment by moment choice, guys. For each one of you in here this morning. Man, I'm so thankful that you're here. And Alan's already expressed that heart. And I'm so thankful, I don't know each one of you, but I'm thankful that you've made a decision in your heart, in your life at some point to follow him. But can I encourage you and remind you that it's not just about that decision. It's about the daily choice to follow him and to continue. And say, you know what? Actually, yeah, I have made a decision to follow him. And I'm going to continue doing that when it's really tough, when it's a challenge. Are we living our life with the end in mind? The man who started the tower, he didn't finish. What does it say to us? It says, live with the end in mind. How do our actions reflect our faith, our hope, our joy? And finally, is our faith costly? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. We're making daily decisions based on our belief in Jesus. Financial decisions. Time-wise decisions. Focus decisions. Energy decisions. Based on our belief in Jesus Christ. Is who he says he was. The Son of God. That's challenging. That is a reflection for us of what it means to stand up every day to bear our cross and say, you know what, I make decisions, not based on the financial climate that Owl and Greenspan or Josh Frydenberg is telling me, but on what Jesus Christ is telling me. I'm going to spend my time not on what my culture is telling me I should be doing, but on what Jesus and the Holy Spirit is speaking into my heart and leading me to do. Come on. Has it gotten really quiet in here or is it just me? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I'll preach to myself because that's me. That's my heart right there, okay? That's our decision. Who's that Paul 
in our life, that someone that's driving us to him, that's challenging us, that's pulling us closer. And who are we pulling along? Who's the Timothy in our life that we're reaching back and we're saying, hey, come along with me. Hey, young YWAMer, you're going to come and you're going to be part of my story. Maybe I'm going to buy you a coffee or maybe I'm going to spend time with you or maybe I'm just going to invest in your life. See, this is where, this is where faith and justice really begin to intersect for me. I know you guys were thinking about that. Well, this, what's it got to do with compassion? Okay? Because compassion, see, compassion is not just about giving money to sponsor a kid. It's about acting in the way of God's justice in the world. We are believing and trusting and taking a step of faith with our finances, but also with our prayer, with our intentionality, with our focus, to say, what's God's world look like? I want to live that way. And compassion, sponsoring a kid, for example, is just one of the ways that you can demonstrate that, that you can have that reminder on your fridge every day or whenever or wherever to say, yeah, that's, that's the world I will live for. That's the world I believe in. That's the world I'm living in now. Because the kingdom of heaven is among us. See? Woo! I get excited right now. This is fun. This is where it's really cool. This is where we get to see the reality of God's demonstration of his grace and his love and the cross lived out in our life, guys. Is faith costly to us? Does it cost us something financially? Does it cost us something in terms of our choices? I was really challenged recently, kind of going back. <laughs> Funny, I didn't, I didn't intend it to be this way. And definitely after the latest news, it was actually in a Bunnings when I had this coughing fit. <laughs> it had nothing to do with Bunnings, okay? It just happened to be in a Bunnings, okay? <clears throat> anyway. Some of you guys are looking at me like, huh? It's okay. It's okay. It doesn't matter. It's just in a Bunnings. Um, and I had this coughing fit, and I had this moment where I got angry. Like, why are people upset at me because I'm coughing? It's just, it's just a bit of dust in my throat, guys. Calm down. And it was like that moment when kind of the, the veil of life is lifted, the, the, the mirage of our world sort of, steps back, and I, I give God the glory and the credit, because it was like him speaking into my ear. Yeah, living in this kind of fear, they don't know me. They don't have the hope of glory living in their life. Not to say that I never get afraid, but the fear I saw in people's eyes, the fear you might see in someone's eyes near you or your family, breaks your heart. It's like as a reality of like, yeah, I wasn't made for this world. See what I'm saying there? I wasn't made for this world. Thank you, Father. Now, actually, I, can, I have a little bit more courage to be respectful and say, I'm sorry, because I really understand why you'd be afraid. My daughter asked me the other day, she's like, uh, Dad, why are so many... Uh, we, sorry, it's, a long, it's somewhat a separate story, but she's asking, she was asking, why do people essentially, uh, in their life. Why do, why do famous people die? Or, you know, why, why, what do they, why do they do this? Why? And she's, she's struggling with these things as a young woman, right? As a young girl growing up in school, and she's seeing a lot of musicians and different things. And I said, you know what? Because they don't have hope. They don't have hope. If we truly live a cheap grace, guys, I promise you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail you. You'll get to the bottom one day. You'll get to the end after this service. You'll get home and you'll be like, you know what? I've got nothing to hope for. Because actually, grace doesn't mean that much to me. And I wasn't willing. I'm not willing to make that decision to truly follow him. Whereas when we do, guys... My, Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Accept me. Choose to walk in my way. I promise you, it's the best way to live. Unfortunately, we sometimes need a global pandemic to remind us of that. 
But the reality is it's always the case. That's always the truth. I want to introduce you to my little girl, little Shaksana from Compassion. She's actually in Sri Lanka. And as a church, you guys have been a part of journeying with this country and what God's doing in Sri Lanka. I'll tell you a little bit about her. She just turned two. Uh, she's about a month younger than my boy, uh, Shaksana. Uh, she loves art and drawing, playing house, and attending the project. See, with Compassion, every child project, every place in the world that these kids are interacting, is through a local church. It's not me standing over there saying, hello, everyone, welcome, you're sponsored. No, it's a local church. It's a rise in Sri Lanka where Compassion has an opportunity to journey with local churches like yourself, but also like the local church that she's a part of, which it'll say here. I'm going to try and find it because every one of these profiles, and I encourage you, uh, I've got 10 kids back here this morning. I brought 10 kids with me. I would love for you to come and just have a look. Look through these, read up about them, read up their stories. So she's at the Willem Alt Child Development Center in Eastern Province, Sri Lanka. So the, because of child safety and child protection reasons, they don't put the details on that. But that, that's the name of their project in the local church is the is a village a coastal village and i can't even na- say the name of that village you guys might have been there i don't know um it's home to about twenty-one thousand people which actually is a small village in sri lanka <laughs> um but there's a local church that she's a part of um compassion did some figures did some study just within our projects and i i put some the numbers up here that every one of the compassion kids every one of these kids are part of a local church and get to hear about the message of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Every one of these kids in a compassion project get a chance to hear the message of Jesus Christ. How good is that? Can we give that? Yeah, we can clap. Give God the glory. In 2016, so it's a bit dated now, this is the conservative figures. 137,290 kids in, in just through compassion made declarations of faith in Jesus Christ. How cool is that? Let's give that a clap. Amen. And Compassion would say, Compassion, again, conservative estimates, that at least four individuals, four adults around these children have a chance to hear the saving message of Jesus Christ just through something as simple as child sponsorship. And that's a conservative estimate because if you've ever heard about many of these places in the world or maybe been to them There's a lot more than four adults living in one household. Reality is it could be 12, you know, six adults. It's the the parents, it's the grandparents, it's the aunts and uncles. You think about this particularly, how COVID is ravaging the developing world. Um, My little girl's here. Her dad's uh, a day laborer, which translates in a COVID world, unemployed. Because where nobody can meet and uh, mingle and gather, likely means her dad's out of work. So sponsorship is, again, it's not about money, guys. And I want you to hear that this morning. I want you to hear the encouragement. If you sponsor a kid, thank you so much. Thank you for giving. If you sponsor, if you're part of somebody's life in some way, thank you. Can I encourage you and challenge you, encourage you to look at changing another child's life? Yeah? Can I encourage you to make a decision. You might run a business. Can I encourage you to, cha- uh, to start a legacy of a village? That's a village of 21,000. You could literally walk into that village and say, you know what? We want to see this whole village changed for Christ. What can we do? Starting a legacy, sponsoring 10 kids. A business could do that easy. You might be here. You've never sponsored a child before. Uh, it's 11, we broke it down, it's $11.08 a week to sponsor a child. This kid has a chance to be a part of your family. You're going to get called from Compassion, and they're going to say thank you for partnering. Um, you're going to have a chance if you're online, you can write a letter even. You're going to get mailed physically a letter that you can write to them, write prayers, pray for them. And when these restrictions change, I would love to hear 
about you visiting them. How cool is that? Because we, I, I, I feel like that's, I've, I've had a chance to visit several of my sponsor kids through Compassion. It's a life-changing experience. In my opinion, my favorite part is sponsoring a kid. But the reality is, it's not about money. It's about relationship. And it's about a choice that we make to say, you know what, I want to live in God's way. I want to live in reflection of God's kingdom because then I, you're going to get actually a compassion. I love how they do these little framed magnets. They stick up on your fridge, classic Christian fridge. And you can have a sponsor child on your fridge. There's nothing special about that. The reason it's on your fridge for me is because it's a reminder every day of like, you know what? That's releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. That's the world I live for. That's where I want to be. That's how I want to live, guys. That's the heartbeat. That's the heartbeat. So can I encourage you? Can I encourage you? If it's something on your heart, God's leading you this morning, come find me. I'll be back at the table. But I want to leave you guys this morning with an encouragement and a challenge. It takes a global pandemic for sometimes for us to stop and think, what does it mean? What does grace cost us? Are we choosing, are we choosing to walk in discipleship in the way of Jesus? And, um, yeah. Can I pray for you? Is that all right, Alan? Can I pray for you? And I, 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 uh, this has been my first time to actually share in a physical church in a while. So this is really cool. Um, and one thing that I really always love to do is I, I like to pray for Shaksana and her family and lift them up in their country. Uh, so can we pray together? Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for the invitation, the challenge that your scripture and your word gives us every day when we open it we stop and says, calls us closer to you. But Father, it's not in a harsh way. It's not a judgmental way. It's not in a rebuking, re um, rejecting way. Father, your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. Father, your conviction, it's healing. It's healing for us. It's actually really good. Father, I want to feel your presence in my life every day challenge me, encourage me, lead me, give me your grace to make decisions of you, towards you and towards faith and following you each day. Father, I want to lift up Shaksan to you and her family in Sri Lanka. Father, I want to lift up the village and what you're doing in that community right now. We know how much COVID is messing up our modern machinery of life. Can't even imagine what that looks like in a country like Sri Lanka or in Indonesia, or in the Philippines, or in places where, Father, just, just the food to live is an incredible gift. Father, I pray for them and their family. I pray for health issues that she might be facing right now in her family. She's a young girl. She's got a lot of life ahead of her, Father. And I pray that we would have an opportunity to be your hands and feet, but ultimately, Father, it's because of you and your grace that we have a chance to live. And I pray for fullness in her life. I pray for fullness in her family. I pray for her mom, Father, that you'd give her your peace. Lift up the country of Sri Lanka to you. Thank you so much that you have given us the privilege to be here this morning and to be a part of your kingdom. We love you. We thank you. We give this morning to you in your name. Amen. Alan, my brother. Oh, good. Can, can everyone just do me a favor? Those of you that come regularly here will know exactly what I'm doing. Everyone look at the crack in the wall there. See where the, 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 the concrete slabs join. I want somebody that comes regularly here to tell me, what does that crack represent? What is it again? Someone tell me. You all know. Your life, that's right. I want you to imagine that crack in the wall is your life. Eternity, or even though it goes beyond this, you go from the beginning of that wall to the end, that's eternity. That crack in the wall, that's your life. That's the time that you have here on planet Earth. That's the amount of breaths you have. That's the amount of money you're going to earn. That's the amount of energy you're going to have to make an eternal difference somewhere so that outside of that crack that there'll be people beyond that in eternally that you'll be able to be engaged with who can say thank you so much for the money that you gave. Thank you so much for the prayers you prayed. Thank you so much for the energy and the time. Thank you for taking me out. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me and so on and so on. We've got one crack in the wall to live. That's it. We don't get a second crack in the wall. 
Okay, we don't get a second crack in the wall. I want Daniel, uh, where are you, Daniel? Where'd you go? I want Daniel to come up to me at the end of today. I want a phone call from Daniel, and, and, and I think this is possible. I want you to ring me up and abuse me and say, you should have told me to bring more than 10 kids because I had no idea that, that these people here would get behind this and would see not just uh, uh, the child being sponsored, but that it's actually a part of bringing the kingdom of God to earth. We pray for the kingdom to come. Jesus said, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven well these kids are looked after in heaven and so we get a chance to be a part of that so thank you so much for what you shared with us this morning mate and i want that phone call i'm challenging you i want a phone call from daniel to say you should have told me that there were i should have brought more than 10 kids this morning okay anyone anyone amen that amen that's good and that's good awesome let's get daniel on the team you guys want to come on up just lead us in in a song we'll finish up this morning <laughs> now i don't know everybody uh that's here in this place this morning so i just want to ask you a simple question are you are you right with god have you surrendered your life as daniel was talking about to jesus christ the story of jesus is not up there with santa claus and the easter money jesus was a real historical figure you'll find evidence outside of the bible for jesus uh the very fact of what today is the date the very calendar uh, uh, that we revolve our world around uh, is a part of the evidence that this man called Jesus did walk. He did do some amazing things, but he made some amazing claims as well. He said that he was the son of God. He said that he had come to die on a cross, not for anything that he'd done, but for all the screw-ups and the stuff-ups that you and I had done, the sins that we had committed in our own lives. He also said this. He said there's only one way to get right with God. There's only one way to have the guilt taken away the the condemnation the shame there's only one way to have that wall of separation that wall of sin that's built between you and god he said there's only one way for that to be dealt with and he said here's the here's here's the beauty of it you got the easy part because i did the tough stuff the bible says this it says that he who knew no sin he who had done nothing wrong was treated as if he'd done everything wrong so that you can come humbly before god and be looked upon as if you've now done nothing wrong. The gospel message is that simple. We make a choice to surrender ourselves to God. We make a decision. We go, man, if Jesus Christ would die for me, if he would die for me, then that's the sort of man I want to give my life over to and follow. That's the sort of guy that I want to bow my knee to. That's the person I want to take my instruction from. If you're in this room this morning and you have never given your life over to Jesus. As Daniel said today, it's a daily choice. It's not a case of just saying a prayer one day. But every journey has a starting point. And I'm wondering if you're in this room this morning and you don't know Jesus. Is there something in your heart? Is there a butterfly running around in your belly right now? Is there something saying to you, you know what, today could be the beginning of something new. Today could be my moment. If that's you, I want everyone just close your eyes for a second. Respect what's going on here. If that's you in this place, I just want you to do a simple thing. I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. It's just a simple act of faith. It's something you can do before God in this room right now and say, God, that's me. If that's you, I just want to ask you. Just raise your hand. Right, that's fine. That's fine. Well, let's all stand to our feet. We're going to finish by just declaring again and speaking out that God is good. God is good. Amen. Okay, when we finish there, Daniel's going to be up the back. Can I encourage you, grab this man, get in his ear, badger him, find out what you can. Uh, I, I want to see those 10 kids taken away and out of the, the dust of poverty and, and being given a chance to hear the good news about Jesus Christ, just like my kids get to in my home. Well, these kids deserve that right as well. Jesus died so they could have that right. So let's stand up. Let's